There we go. Okay. Um, so first of all, I should uh, acknowledge that I am on the traditional territory of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, which includes the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. Um, so I'll first say a bit about Rick Harbo, as uh, many of you may know his name from the various books he's written, which are very useful for marine biology and uh, the Pacific Reef and Shore. I'll put these up, but I don't know whether you can see. Pacific Reef and Shore is one of them. Shellfish, shells and shellfish. And uh, another one, Wilkes to Whales, which uh, are extremely useful for scuba divers and intertidal walkers. So Rick is also a, a biologist. He was a, worked at fisheries and oceans in Nanaimo for 36 years. And since his retirement, he's also research associate at the Royal BC Museum, carrying on his research on various marine animals. And uh, there's several other books he's written as well, which uh, too many to mention. <laughs> so with that, I'll uh, hand it over to Rick. And he's gonna talk about uh, non-native introduced species. So there you go, Rick. Okay, Welcome. thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, this evening about Ladysmith Harbor. Okay, just a few acknowledgments. Uh, Warren Johnny and the Sumanus uh, First Nations uh, allowed access to some of the field sites in Ladysmith Harbor. Um, uh, sponges, uh, the late Bill Austin and the late Henry Reiswig. Um, helped in identifying a number of the sponges. In fact, uh, one of them we published as a, a new species, um, Dr. Bruce Ott, Neil McDaniel, and uh, various other uh, experts in the uh, uh, various fields of the critters that we're gonna look at. So here's Ladysmith Harbor. Uh, for those who don't know, it's sort of mid, mid Vancouver Island um, and one of the major features of uh, Ladysmith Harbor are these mud flats at the head of the harbor. And uh, on the low tides, uh, summer low tides, these tidal flats are exposed, they heat up and uh, warm the water as the uh, flood tide comes in. So um, the locals claim it's the uh, warmest harbor north of San Francisco. And uh, it certainly got warm this, uh, uh, this summer, uh, we got a, a surface water temperature about one meter. It was uh, 27 degrees centigrade. And uh, talking to folks at uh, the Deep Bay Marine Station, they had a, uh, uh, a reading of 30 degrees centigrade in surface waters in, uh, in June up at Fanny Bay. So it's getting pretty warm in some of these waters. So I'm going to talk a little bit about non-native species uh, and how they were introduced. Um, normally, they're described as introduced uh, if they are not um, harming or taking up habitat of native species. If they are a problem, then they're generally referred to as invasive. And so uh, in Ladysmith Harbor, um, most of these species were introduced uh, along with intentional introductions of Japanese oysters, uh, Atlantic oysters, and um, some mussel introductions. So we employed a number of sampling techniques, um, working in the intertidal. Um, there's Andy Lamb did a, a dive for us and did some collections for uh, marine life celebration that we had at Ladysmith. Uh, I hung, uh, lids and rings from the dock. And in a matter of months uh, on the right there, uh, they were covered with a whole number of uh, non-native invasive species. The big, big one that you can see there is a, a club tunicate style of clava. So, uh, and large clumps of, of mussels. Um, so it's, it's not a friendly place to moor your boat. Uh, in a matter of months, there's a very heavy fouling uh, on your hull. 
Uh, like all good biologists, there's a lot of slogging through the mud. Uh, we, we used a small dredge at times to uh, um, uh, collect some of the small organisms. So Ladysmith Harbor was originally called uh, Oyster Harbor, and that was based on the large populations of native uh, and what became known as Olympia oysters. And uh, they were harvested uh, quite intensively from about 1884 uh, right up until the 1930s. So as those populations declined, uh, there was interest in uh, bringing in other oysters for aquaculture. And uh, uh, that was the Atlantic oysters. And then from there, Japanese oysters. So there's still remnant populations of uh, native oysters in Ladysmith Harbor. Um, there, there seems to be more clumps of uh, native oysters in Ladysmith Harbors than other places in the Salish Sea. Uh, there are a few pretty healthy populations of native oysters on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Uh, on the left, you'll see a large oyster that's a Japanese Pacific oyster, and uh, these are all the native oysters. So the native oysters were harvested and they were um, uh, placed in small jars and, uh, and bottles. And um, there may be as many as 75 uh, oysters, uh, native oysters in one of these small pint bottles. And I calculated in, in a, one of the years of harvest in Ladysmith Harbor, uh, they probably took over 5 million pieces. So uh, as the uh, native oysters declined, there was a lot of interest in Atlantic oysters, and they were being uh, shipped by rail uh, across to California uh, and down in the States, uh, but um, they would have to come by ship from there to, uh, um, to BC. Um, but along with the Atlantic oysters came a, a number of species, sponges, uh, soft shell clams, which are now all the way up the coast. Um, and uh, there's a marsh snail, uh, myocetella, and uh, there were populations of Atlantic oyster drills in Boundary Bay and Ladysmith Harbor, uh, but there's no sites in BC where we can find them today. Uh, but in Washington, there's still some remnant populations of Atlantic oyster drills. And uh, because Atlantic oysters have uh, died out, uh, they now feed happily on Japanese oysters. So you've got one exotic eating another exotic species. So some of these uh, Atlantic introductions may not have been direct introductions to Ladysmith Harbor. Uh, they were uh, through larval, larval uh, forms that drifted into the harbor, um, particularly some of the mussel species. Um, the bryozoans probably came attached to uh, different parts of uh, oysters when they were introduced. Um, and same with the tunicates, they probably, they may have actually physically uh, came directly into Ladysmith Harbor. And uh, this June, uh, the European green crab was found for the first time in Ladysmith Harbor. So it, it's been popping up in a whole number of places now in inside waters, um, Boundary Bay, Salt Spring Island, Pender Harbor, um, Ladysmith Harbor, Crofton, uh, a number of sites. So the introduction of the Japanese oysters was initially thought to be from uh, early Japanese fishermen and, and uh, settlers. And uh, they were started planting out uh, Japanese oysters for their own purposes. And uh, as the Atlantic oysters uh, kind of failed to reproduce, uh, it was noticed that um, there were these big oysters growing on the rocks in Ladysmith Harbor. And one of the oyster farmers collected some of these and, and took them to the biological station in Nanaimo. And that was, uh, part of the early beginning of uh, Japanese oyster aquaculture uh, in British Columbia. Ladysmith became one of the uh, important study sites. 
So the oyster seed uh, was shipped uh, from Japan uh, in boxes. And uh, these boxes were packed with uh, um, seaweed, sargassum, uh, which probably a lot of you are familiar with. Uh, they were kept on deck and covered with wet mats to, to try to keep them cool. Um, so the, the BC uh, oyster farmers uh, joined uh, with the uh, Washington oyster farmers and uh, all of the, um, there were no shipments that came directly um, to British Columbia. They all came to Washington and then they were shipped again from Washington to BC. So this is what I would call an invasive species, <laughs> Sargassum muticum, uh, Japanese wireweed. Um, it was established in probably in the late 1940s. Um, it became a real problem with uh, uh, both commercial and uh, commercial trollers, salmon trollers, and uh, sport trollers, uh, because it continually uh, fouled um, fishing lines and lures and um, really reduce the effective uh, fishing capacity of the fleet. So even though Japanese oysters, um, the large shipments started in the 1920s and the 1930s, uh, but it wasn't until 1947 that the uh, uh, Pacific Coast oyster growers uh, sent inspectors to Japan to inspect and approve oyster seed shipments. Now, this wasn't uh, truly an effort to uh, restrict uh, introduced or non-native species. It was uh, more to do with uh, the quality and, and uh, size and uh, number of oyster seed in the various boxes. But this did became a, a, a useful tool that uh, eliminated some of the uh, uh, organisms that were being shipped along with the oyster seed. Now, oyster seed uh, from Japan ceased in about 19, in the 1970s was the last actual shipment and uh, to BC. And now um, the uh, oysters are, uh, eyed larvae are uh, raised in a hatchery. The larvae are sold to the farmers and they, they will set them on um, different substrates and tanks at their farms. So they don't directly bring oyster seed from Japan anymore. So saying that, um, there's still a number without repeated introductions now, uh, there's still some that have uh, managed to establish and persist. Now this is a, an old oyster shack. Uh, at the head of Ladysmith Harbor back in the 1950s. So some of the common uh, invasive species, uh, and some of these uh, were intentionally introduced, Atlantic oysters. Um, they were first introduced in 1896. Uh, there were some in 1905. Um, the uh, Canadian government brought out a rail car of Atlantic oysters, they chartered a boat and they went and distributed sacks of Atlantic oysters in a whole number of bays, including Ladysmith Harbor. Um, Japanese oysters um, probably were first seeded uh, somewhere in the early 1900s. Um, it wasn't really until the 1920s that it became a, a large commercial enterprise. Uh, so along with the, the oysters came Japanese uh, and Atlantic oyster drills, little snails that would drill on the uh, small oysters. Um, Manila clams, which are now the major uh, uh, species in the uh, intertidal clam fisheries, were accidentally introduced along with oyster shipments. And uh, Dan Coyle first uh, discovered and described these in Ladysmith Harbor as a new species, uh, published a paper, and then very shortly after had to publish uh, another paper uh, identifying them as Japanese vanilla clams. Uh, the uh, Japanese seaweed, uh, probably again in the late 1930s, uh, possibly 40s. And uh, there's also um, some records possibly of invasive tunicates uh, 
as early as the 1930s. And uh, there's probably been reintroduction of invasive tunicates because they are very uh, abundant now in Ladysmith Harbor. So looking uh, at the harbor, I soon found a couple of species that look very strange. And uh, so we found two new North American records of uh, populations that had established that are nowhere else in North America has any population of a chitin become established. Uh, nowhere else in North America has a population of limpets, uh, exotic limpets been established. Um, we described a new um, a Japanese uh, orange iso sponge, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, although it came from Japan, uh, it turns out it really wasn't Japanese. Um, and then we found a whole number of new records of invas invasive uh, species in Ladysmith Harbor. Um, and some of these may have been uh, uh, more recent. Some of them may have just been overlooked because most of the surveys uh, in the initial years were looking more at um, pests that were affecting the oyster aquaculture rather than just uh, biological records. So this is the uh, orange iso sponge and it has a, a quite a history. Um, it turned out that it's an Atlantic sponge that was introduced with Atlantic oysters to California. And then somewhere in the 1950s, uh, it was uh, um, transported and introduced to Japan uh, from California. And then in turn, it was introduced from Japan to Ladysmith Harbor. So what we had originally thought was a, a, a Japanese uh, species that was introduced and it actually turned out it, it was a, an Atlantic species. So this uh, sponge was originally identified by uh, Henry Reiswick. Um, it's smooth, pointed processes. Um, it's quite unusual because uh, intertidal um, sponges are really not that common and especially on mud flats. So some sponges have um, abilities to tolerate high levels of siltation. They may produce mucus or um, occasionally be able to pump uh, water to eliminate the silt. But uh, uh, these sponges were um, highly visible and quite abundant. And it was kind of a surprise that they'd never really been uh, described before. So this, this is just a little uh, intertidal uh, flat and there's all little bits of sponges growing on the shells. There's actually two species here, uh, one of which we described as a new species, but I suspect that it's uh, uh, been described somewhere before and is deep and dark in the Japanese literature. Uh, so this sponge, uh, like a number of introduced species uh, provides uh, a new food source for a number of animals. Uh, this orange sponge um, supports the largest um, sea lemons, Monterey sea lemons I've ever seen. Uh, they're just really happy gorging away at these in the intertidal. Uh, so native oysters, uh, again, they, uh, covered with the sponge. In some cases, the sponge has actually, um, I think, killed the, the native oysters, but it's really not at a level that's uh, affected um, their populations or, or their recovery. Another non-native Atlantic sponge uh, is the yellow crumb of bread sponge. Uh, lots of this in Ladysmith. Um, so it, it's uncertain whether this was directly introduced with Atlantic oysters or um, was spread later on through the movement of uh, ships and, and other agriculture activities. So Ladysmith Harbor identified about uh, seven to nine species of bivalves of clams. 
There's the uh, Japanese oyster, the Manila clam, uh, which um, began in Ladysmith Harbor. And the Japanese oyster, uh, when it was first introduced to um, uh, Ladysmith Harbor, they were actually able to track its spread and uh, oyster spat was settling in areas anywhere from 20 to 30 kilometers uh, in a season. So it gives you an idea of uh, how far a larval uh, form can drift over a period of four to six weeks. Uh, there's Japanese green mussels. Uh, there's now the varnish or savory clam, um, a Japanese shipworm, uh, a trapezium clam. Uh, this is one that was introduced. Um, it hasn't survived in Ladysmith Harbor, uh, but there's still populations of this clam in Boundary Bay and Willapaw Bay down in uh, Washington. The softshell clam was probably introduced in the late 1800s to California, and those larvae probably worked their way up the coast. So the softshell clams that we find in Ladysmith Harbor um, probably originated from a large pool of uh, softshell clam spawning rather than direct introductions. Um, can't find any Atlantic oysters in um, Ladysmith Harbor, but there is one remnant population of Atlantic oysters. Uh, over a hundred years, they've uh, survived in uh, the Nicomachal and Ser Serpentine uh, estuaries in Boundary Bay. And most recently, uh, Atlantic mussels and uh, Gallo Provincialis mussels are uh, very abundant in Ladysmith Harbor, um, approaching almost the size of the West Coast surf mussels. Um, so quite, quite large mussels. Uh, this is the uh, Japanese green mussel. Uh, it's usually found buried in sand and gravel and it's bissel threads. Um, kind of uh, attach or gravel kind of bind into here and that holds the muscle into the substrate. Now in some locations, these actually get to very high densities, uh, but we haven't seen those uh, in BC or Washington, but uh, this muscle has been introduced to uh, Australia, New Zealand and other places uh, where they've got uh, very high densities. Uh, there's at least uh, three species of uh, dock mussels or bay mussels in Ladysmith Harbor. There's the, the native species, Middleus trosselus, uh, but there's also two exotics. There's a Mediterranean, uh, the Gallo Provincialis, and the Atlantic, uh, Middleus edulis, and uh, they all hybridize amongst one another. So when you see a mussel in uh, Ladysmith Harbor, it's pretty tough to tell what species it is because the uh, shells uh, shape and formation are not always a good diagnostic feature. So uh, DNA work has kind of separated these out. And uh, what I'm trying to do at some stage is look at uh, the mantles of the different uh, muscles uh, are quite unique in terms of their uh, shape and form and color. And uh, so we might be able to match up uh, the mantles with the various species for field ID. So there are a number of gastropods or snails we find in Ladysmith Harbor. Um, the Atlantic oyster drills, uh, there were quite a large collection of, uh, in the museum, there was 30 specimens collected on one day in Ladysmith Harbor uh, in the 1930s. Um, they haven't really been seen there since. So that was a species that probably uh, was there just from repeated introductions of uh, Atlantic oysters that were brought from the East Coast. Uh, the Japanese oyster drills, though they've survived quite well, um, they were abundant in 1935 and uh, they're still very abundant in Ladysmith Harbor. Uh, there's a mudflat snail battle area, and probably a lot of people have seen this all throughout the Strait of Georgia. Um, Dan Quayle, back in the 1930s or 40s, remarked on the high densities of 80 per meter squared. Uh, the densities now are in some areas are around 1,000 per meter squared. So uh, um, they've 
uh, survived and increased uh, over time. Uh, and there's a, another little mud snail uh, that was first recorded in 2014 um, in uh, um, Ladysmith Harbor. Again, probably in a lot of areas, it's just in muddy areas that a lot of people don't seem to uh, find the fun to go and search. Uh, there's a salt marsh snail. These are tiny. These are about 10 millimeters, uh, very high abundance. And these are in the pickleweed salt marsh area and uh, turning over wood debris, little bits of bark and wood. Uh, you find these marsh snails. They're actually air breathing snails. Um, so they, they can't be immersed uh, uh, for any long period of time uh, in, in the water. So they're right up. Uh, sort of beyond the high water mark in the uh, salt marsh. And uh, these are the mudflat snails, the Battleria. Um, we said these, these are very abundant and common in Strait of Georgia. Just in Lady Smith Harbor, here's a, a 101 uh, in a quarter meter square quadrat. So that's four, 400 plus. Uh, in a square meter. So the Japanese oyster drill, um, so all of the drills and, and a lot of snails have unique egg cases. And so you're able to actually identify them in the field by the shape of the eggs that they lay. And uh, this is at the Head of Lady Smith Harbor. And you can see there's a whole number of, uh, of, of snails and they're actually laying their eggs uh, right all over uh, native oysters. Uh, and uh, so these uh, uh, egg cases, the larvae develop and actually into little crawlaway snails. So they, this particular species doesn't spread widely uh, because they, uh, they don't have a, a pelagic larval stage. They have a, a crawlaway uh, larvae, but uh, uh, they make up for it by abundance. And you can find lots of uh, manila clams and oysters, little drill holes. And uh, these have been made by the uh, Japanese oyster drill. And this is our little uh, Japanese uh, mud snail, Japanese NASA, uh, usually found in really soft, silty areas. Here's a little siphon sticking out of the, uh, out of the mud. And you find a lot of these by flipping over rocks. And uh, these are the, the little egg cases of the uh, uh, Japanese NASA. So again, uh, the egg cases can be a, a, a clue to the identity of some of the snails that we find in the harbor. So one of the uh, other interesting uh, phenomena are, uh, it, this is your new uh, term, LDEs, or limpet disturbance effects. And uh, a lot of limpets uh, have home and feeding territories that they establish. And uh, this is uh, um, Ladia pelta. And you can see that they've, they've kind of uh, uh, created their own space here uh, and sort of farm their field of, of algae that grows in this uh, space. And uh, um, not terribly common, but uh, you can find this in various areas in the Strait of Georgia. So th this is a fairly common phenomenon that you would see in the Strait. Um, in other areas, uh, limpets form home scars. So they will actually have a feeding uh, and homing territory and uh, they will actually end up uh, creating um, holes in the rock and uh, they, they will go out and feed from these holes uh, at high tides and come back at low tides uh, and, and hunker right down here and that they're able to uh, seal up so they don't lose moisture on low tides. So th this is in the UK. Um, so we don't have any lipids uh, in British Columbia that create home scars. Uh, not any native species. Uh, so in Ladysmith Harbor, uh, 
when I was looking at oyster shells, I found that uh, here was a limbic creating home scars. And this, this was not a normal behavior for native species. So uh, along with other material, um, uh, we sent it off to be uh, barcoded. And sure enough, it turned out to be a Japanese uh, limpet that uh, uh, grows on oysters and actually feeds and creates these deep, deep home scars on uh, Japanese oysters. And uh, as I said earlier, uh, this is the only known population of uh, non-native oyster or limpets uh, that have established in North America. Nowhere else has this uh, uh, been recorded. Uh, here's a native um, limpet uh, that forms home scars. This is Laudia scabra, uh, but it's found in California and you really don't find it north of Oregon. So although on the Pacific coast, we have a few limpets that create home scars in British Columbia, um, we don't have any that I'm aware of. Uh, so here's some, here's some pretty deep home scars on uh, Japanese oysters. And uh, so you can see uh, they've spent some time um, feeding and coming back and, and uh, creating uh, a home on these oyster shells. And just another, so these are there's quite abundance. There's all sorts of uh, um, scars uh, from past and present uh, uh, species there on there. So the other strange creature that we found in Ladysmith Harbor was a tufted chitin. Um, again, this is a chitin that has a little um, uh, tufts around the uh, girdle. Um, there's no uh, native species of chitons in British Columbia that has, uh, has this feature. Uh, so uh, pretty obvious feature and we immediately knew that uh, this was uh, an introduced species. And after mm, uh, about eight years, we still haven't identified it to species. Uh, there's uh, a team of uh, people that have been looking at it, DNA and and the morphology a fellow in Korea, a fellow in Japan, uh, led by Doug Ernesty in California. And uh, they have yet to uh, come to agreement on what species uh, this is in uh, Ladysmith Harbor. But again, this came from Japan. I've actually found it on Japanese oysters. So I believe that was a, a mode of transport. They were attached to oysters that were uh, shipped from Japan. Uh, two ladies and two ladies with harbor, and, uh, and they've survived um, probably fifty or more years. Uh, they've been in the harbor, so quite quite a quite a beautiful and uh, unique chitin. Um, I've asked several people, and no one has been able to give me an answer yet as the purpose of these uh, bristles. Um, so uh, another little mystery to uh, investigate. A uh, number of bryozoans uh, were introduced to Ladysmith Harbor. This is a, a bryozoan that um, came on Atlantic oysters and it grows over uh, um, uh, rocks, and mussels and oysters in the harbor. Uh, another uh, purple bryozoan, this one uh, is uh, Japanese. Um, so in, in all, I'm probably, I'm well over 40, uh, 40 species of marine species that are uh, non-native in Ladysmith Harbor and uh, still have a few more to, to find. Uh, so an interesting one is a Japanese lined anemone. And uh, this has probably been introduced uh, a number of times by a number of different uh, uh, methods. It was actually first described in BC, uh, Galliano Islands in the late 1800s uh, before any shipments of Japanese oysters. Uh, so it's quite likely it was initially introduced from uh, shipping activities. 
Um, and uh, it's super abundant in Ladysmith Harbor um, and grows in a number of habitats. It, it's very tolerant to silt and mud, so it can grow on a shell or a piece of bark, uh, a hard substrate that's in the, uh, in the mud. And uh, it also then grows on, uh, on rocks. It's the only anemone that we have that has uh, bright orange lines. Uh, so there's no, no uh, native anemone species here that uh, has that feature. And there was a recent study um, at UBC where they looked at uh, a distribution of this uh, particular anemone. Um, they were excited to find three or 400 um, in a period of 18 to 20 minutes. Uh, in Ladysmith Harbor, you can just look and you can see thousands at a glance. So they're uh, just an ideal habitat in the warm waters of Ladysmith. Uh, there's a, another little anemone, very similar to the lined one. Uh, it's another diadumene species. Um, I haven't been able to identify it. And it's part of a, I've collected some and they uh, uh, were shipped uh, to the University of uh, Ohio. And this was just pre-COVID. And so those uh, samples, there's been samples from around the world of uh, different species in this genus and uh, that work is yet to be uh, work done yet. Uh, so at some time, hopefully in the near future, uh, we might be able to put a name to uh, another uh, invasive species in Ladysmith. Uh, there's a, a little Japanese shrimp. Again, probably came uh, in the uh, oyster seed uh, it was first detect detected in Boundary Bay in the 1990s in British Columbia. Um, we've since, uh, it's one of those things, once you start looking for it, uh, it uh, um, you find it in a number of areas. We found it uh, at Salt Spring Island, um, Ladysmith Harbor, at a number of locations, Souk Basin, the Gorge uh, in Victoria. So many locations where uh, Japanese oysters uh, were introduced, uh, probably you would be able to find this uh, Japanese shrimp. And one of the very abundant, uh, but yet small creatures uh, you see on the docks are a little uh, skeleton shrimp. And uh, they're, see, they're quite bizarre looking little uh, creatures. And uh, these uh, were found on docks all up and down the coast uh, in studying uh, fouling organisms. Uh, again, very abundant in Ladysmith Harbor. The European green crab has um, made its way into the Strait of Georgia, um, found in June 2021 uh, for the first time in Ladysmith Harbor. Um, so the the Key features are, are these five spines uh, on both sides uh, from the eye outwards and uh, sort of the green coloration modeled. Um, and these, in other areas where they've been introduced, they've been quite damaging to eelgrass beds, um, uh, feeding on uh, shellfish and uh, other uh, crab species. Uh, so it's yet to be seen uh, what sort of impact they're going to have in the Strait of Georgia, but they do seem to be uh, increasing and in, uh, spreading uh, throughout the Strait. Club tunicates, uh, Styla claba, fast growing, very abundant. And uh, this is another common uh, tunicate and it's found throughout uh, the Strait of Georgia. Um, it was described, at least um, there is a record of it from Dan Quayle's surveys in the 1930s. Uh, so it may have been around uh, for quite a long time, uh, but uh, there was a big gap between when he reported it and people began to uh, study these uh, more intensively. 
a whole variety of colors, um, white, pink, orange. And uh, you can see that, that they kind of form a line or a chain of uh, little, uh, it's, a, it's a colony of little individuals. Uh, another invasive uh, tunicate is the uh, Atlantic uh, star tunicate. This one perhaps has been introduced uh, more recently, um, either through shipping activity, perhaps some um, transport of Atlantic uh, mussels, it's hard to say. Uh, this one can be anywhere from orange uh, to almost a blue and black color. Uh, again, um, these form a sheet, but they uh, um, cover um, boat hulls and docks and they're, are considered to be a fouling organism. Uh, not to leave out plants, there's a whole number of, uh, of seaweeds that are, um, haven't been able to identify in Ladysmith Harbor, uh, but the common ones, uh, the Japanese wireweed or the sargassum muticum is, is uh, pretty common and obvious. Uh, there's uh, a Japanese red algae, um, Maziella japonica, and uh, this one is actually being harvested commercially up in the deep bay area uh, where it's become very abundant and uh, get wind rows up to over a meter, two meters deep sometimes, uh, this algae washing up in the shore. And uh, so it's being uh, collected and dried and uh, extracts um, uh, taken from it. Um, and there's another little uh, sea tangle that's quite common on the docks. Uh, Japanese uh, eelgrass, which seems to be spreading uh, throughout the Strait of Georgia, a little higher up on the tide than the uh, native eelgrass. So it's hard to say um, how invasive it is, whether it's displacing uh, native eelgrass. Um, it's still uh, undecided on that. Uh, Mike Hawks is uh, from UBC uh, has come out on several occasions to collect and uh, help identify some of the seaweeds there. So this is the uh, the sea tangle um, that's found on the docks in Ladysmith. Um, quite a lovely little uh, seaweed. And that's the end. So I'd uh, be happy to. Uh, answer questions or um, okay thanks very much Rick that's quite a list <laughs> it <laughs> looks like there's room for anything else in, in the harbor <laughs> yeah well actually there's some places where there, it seems like there's nothing but exotic species uh, yeah or quite it's almost like an aquarium in some places All right um i see there's a there's a question in the chat yeah okay. it was about the home scars um but how are they created is it physical or or are there enzymes involved do you know um yeah the, it's something i need to look into more i think there's probably some chemical aspect just because of the the deep uh, nature of some of them yeah and, uh, um, yeah, there would certainly be some physical turning and twisting, maybe a little bit, but uh, yeah, they, they would have to be some kind of chemical action there, I think. Yeah. I was wondering about those uh, tufted chitons. Have they been found anywhere else locally or? Uh, there's, uh, there's a native, well, native species in California and Mexico uh, and, and Australia and New Zealand. Um, diff different genus, I think, different species, but kind of that same um, uh, series of tufts on the on the girdle. Um, but you no, know, the in British Columbia, there's no other chitin that would have that uh, that feature, yeah. which, which was kind of neat because um, there were two or three of us there: George Holm and Bill Merrilies, and we all kind of looked at it and said, "No, I've never seen anything like that before." <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, they're pretty distinctive. <clears throat> um, I was wondering about the, uh, I know when we drive by Ladysmith, there's nearly always freighters anchored out in the bay there. I wonder if that's a, a source of some of these things. Yeah, there's a couple of questions here about our new invasives continuing to be introduced. And um, yes, up until uh, not that long ago, um, well, certainly the, the varnish clam or the mahogany clam uh, was introduced from ballast water into Vancouver Harbor, probably sometime in the 1980s. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the purple shell, you see it on the beach everywhere now. Yeah, it's very yeah. common. They've spread uh, right up into the central coast uh, to the north and far south as Oregon, sort of in the period of about, uh, um, well, I, Guess from the 80s now it's, it's 40 years but uh yeah they they've spread in a, a large way uh, are there new invasives there may be some uh um new things that were brought over with the japanese tsunami debris um there's a debris that washed up in the charlottes and on the uh, west coast of vancouver island um a lot of this material was collected um but I think it, it'll, will, time will tell whether any of those species um, take a foothold uh, in this area. Are there any other questions for Rick? Um, don't see any more on the chat. No, I would, I would say that you could go to just about any beach in the Strait of Georgia and you would find an introduced species, uh, be it Pacific oysters, um, vanilla clams, um, uh, a whole variety of other uh, kind of organisms, seaweeds, uh, the Japanese seaweeds and stuff. So um, they've actually just become part of what we uh, think is natural on a lot of the beaches. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the one of the questions was, um, are there any efforts to prevent <laughs> introduced species? I don't know what. Uh, well, yeah, well, we following the, uh, the Bardish clam sort of uh, introduction, uh, the government really uh, became more serious about restrictions on discharge of ballast water and treatment of ballast water and where that, uh, uh, where that takes place. Um, there's monitoring uh, when things are introduced from other areas. Um, they often have to go through a, a closed system quarantine facility. Um, there's uh, federal regulations against the transport of uh, marine animals from one zone to another zone. So commercial uh, activities and, and uh, culture activities um, uh, have limits on where they can move materials. So, so there's a number of, uh, of regulations that are there to try to uh, um, limit the introduction and then the spread. Um, there's being interest in eradication types of experiments, uh, but they've, they've all turned out to be um, uh, very difficult and it's almost like uh, broom busters. Um, you know, it's, it's a pretty tough, uh, pretty tough uh, thing to, to do. Yeah, one of the, another question from Ian Hatter, what effect are these invasive species having on the natives and ecosystem? Yeah, it, it's like everything, there's, there's positive and negative effects. And I, I mentioned a, a couple of positive effects. Uh, uh, Pacific oysters and manila clams are, are um, commercial and recreational fisheries have uh, been created from those. Um, but yet Pacific oysters, I, I regard Pacific oysters as being invasive. Uh, there's a number of beaches I went uh, to as a kid. You couldn't even walk on the beaches. You would get your feet cut up. Uh, and so when they were first introduced, there, there was actually a lot of complaints uh, about Pacific oysters and limiting Pacific oysters. And, uh, um, and unfortunately, 
Um, not, nothing uh, really happened uh, to restrict their development, but uh, um, the varnish clam, even though it's um, very abundant, it's usually higher up in the tide and in other uh, types of substrates where native species are not really occupying. So they've kind of found their own kind of niche. And uh, it's really interesting to um, observe birds. Um, so they, they feel that oyster catcher populations have actually benefit, benefited and increased in some areas um, because they have this new food source. Yeah. And uh, when varnish clams, we first found them in boundary uh, in Departure Bay in Nanaimo, uh, it was almost three years be before we actually observed the seagulls and the other birds starting to, to, to recognize them and start to feed on them. So there was a bit of a, a lag, lag time there uh, be, before they really started to uh, exploit them. And now it's, it's a major part of their diet. Mm. <clears throat> There's uh, another question from Joseph Connors. Is there any connection between the recent die off of sea stars and invasives? I would say that the only connection is that these things are flourishing um, warm water, uh, you know, and um, like particularly in Ladysmith Harbor. And, and one of the reasons why I'm trying to follow things in Ladysmith Harbor is that there's very discreet um, uh, cutoff points in Ladysmith Harbor uh, where you find uh, certain species. You'll only find them right at the head of the harbor where the water's the warmest and beyond that. Um, you don't find them. So if uh, water temperatures continue to increase, um, perhaps those uh, species will uh, spread to, to greater areas. Um, the sea star wasting disease, they believe, uh, was um, um, has always been around for a long time. There's always been, uh, people have noticed uh, uh, sea stars with, with uh, wasting, but uh, it, it's only when there was really warm water periods that it uh, uh, really uh, took off. And um, things like sunflower stars, um, you very rare find uh, to find them in uh, shallow waters or intertidal, but uh, you would still bring them up in uh, prawn tack traps and long lines and deeper waters. Mm -hmm. So, so I think a lot of the sea star wasting is, is very, very much temperature driven. Uh, another question about uh, from Mary Morris, uh, Pacific oysters and clams presumably eat the same plankton. So in a small area, is it likely Pacific oysters may outcompete clams for food? Yeah, there's, there's been a lot of uh, um, discussion about carrying capacity of areas, uh, particularly in areas that have been zoned as uh, uh, for agriculture development. And, you know, the question is, at some point, um, uh, will there be more clams and oysters than there is plankton? And so far, they really, I don't think they've hit that point yet. Um, but yeah, I, I would presume, considering um, the number of Pacific oysters and manila clams and non-native species, um, you know, may, things may have looked different a hundred years ago when, when we didn't have those kinds of, uh, of uh, abundances of those species. But no one that I know of has really um, demonstrated that. Did I um, understand that they tried to introduce lobsters once way back? Is it Lady Smith or somewhere? Yeah, on the West Coast, they, they tried to introduce lobsters and um, for a number of reasons that never really, um, uh, they just didn't reproduce. And in a number that- uh, Yeah, that I actually worked on that. I actually worked on that project in 1967. Oh, okay, yeah. My summer job. 
feeding yeah. lobsters. Feeding lobsters, yeah. Every three hours. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, in fatty basin. Yeah. But I, I think they tried bringing lobsters sometime before that, and somewhere in Georgia Strait, I recall, but I can't remember where. Yeah, yeah. There, there is some uh, yeah history there. There, there's always the the one story where they released a number of oysters and they forgot to to unpeg their claws, and <laughs> they all they didn't survive. But um, um, yeah, it it um, interesting. So there's logs that escape booming scour the shores. Um, I don't know whether that's enhanced the opportunities for invasives, but yeah, there are people that have uh, speculated what the intertidal looked like before logging <laughs> in British Columbia, when you, uh, you know, how much wood debris and logs and stuff there were on the beaches at that time, probably nowhere near what there is now. Um, so yeah, I would think that they, they have some impact but uh, I don't know that they would particularly enhance uh, uh, in the basins. Okay, any more questions? Don't see any more on the chat. So uh, assuming there are no more, I'll uh, say uh, thank you very much, Rick. It's uh, very enlightening, uh, lots of, stuff projects for you to do to figure out what these species are yeah 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 there's a, yeah it, it's it is very interesting and puzzling that some species uh, have survived but only in very limited areas like there's uh, the atlantic oysters there's only on the um, west coast of north america there's only one small remnant population of atlantic oysters in Boundary Bay, um, nowhere else. Uh, there's another population of uh, uh, another species of uh, uh, angel wing clams in Willapa Bay. Uh, they've been there probably for a hundred years. They haven't spread, nowhere else would you find them. Uh, so th there's these little very micro uh, types of habitats and, and um, I guess a lot of it, deals with how they reproduce and, and uh, the tolerance of the larval uh, distributions. Yeah, I see there's one more question here. Do we know if the invasives survived this summer's heat dome better than the natives? Um, well, some yes, some no. <laughs> um, the, one of the biggest die-offs were the Pacific oysters. Um, in a lot of areas, there's very high mortality of the Pacific oysters. So even though they, they come from warmer waters and a, a warmer climate, uh, it, it was beyond their tolerance. I, I think we'll see uh, uh, over time uh, whether there's uh, any shifts and whether this is a, hopefully is a one-off event. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, with that, I'll uh, say, Thanks again, Rick, and uh, I'll uh, sign off unless there's any more questions. There's some thank yous here. Great talk as always from Stefan Lindgren. Yeah, hi, Stefan. <laughs> Susanna Selecki, thank you. We appreciate your work. And Alison Leduc, thank you, Rick. Very interesting. Seamus McKeating, thank you. There you go. Well, thanks, thanks for the opportunity. It kind of makes it all worthwhile slogging through that mud. Yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> thanks very much. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night.